Explore the past, present, and future of the Great Plains with hands-on, interactive exhibits for all ages. Learn about the people, the places, and the things that make up the Great Plains by watching a show in the auditorium, stopping by the outdoor trading post, or braving through the terrible Tuesday Tornado Theater. Schools, active military, and senior citizens can also come to enjoy the museum for a discounted price. Visit the primary tourist attraction in all of Southwest Oklahoma, the Museum of the Great Plains. Today I want to share with you the story of Wyatt Earp. Actually, the untold story of Wyatt Earp. If you're of the uh, generation that watched the black and white cowboy shows in the 1950s all across the various TV channels, you may be familiar with a very popular one entitled The Life and Legend of Wyatt Earp. And it always began with his theme song. And I'd like to share it with you today because it has some key phrases in it that we're going to talk about in this presentation. It goes like this. I'll tell you a story, a real true life story, a tale of the western frontier. The west it was lawless, but one man was flawless, and his is the story you'll hear. Wyatt Earp. Wyatt Earp, brave, courageous, and bold, long live his fame and long live his glory, and long may his story be told. When he came to Kansas, to settle in Kansas, he dreamed of a peaceable life, some goods and some chattel, a few head of cattle, a home and a sweet loving wife. Now he wasn't partial to being a marshal, but fate went and dealt him his hand. While outlaws were looting and killing and shooting, he knew that he must take a stand. Well, he cleaned up the country, the old Wild West country. He made law and order prevail. And none can deny it, the legend of Wyatt forever will live on the trail. And so goes the uh, misleading theme song of the 1950s television show, The Life and Legend of Wyatt Earp. A little background on Wyatt. His full name was Wyatt Barry Stapp Earp. He was born in Monmouth, Illinois on March 19, 1848 and died January 13, 1929 in Los Angeles, making him one of the Wild West's longest living personalities. The names Wyatt Barry Stapp were given him in recognition of his father's commanding officer in the Mexican War. Wyatt is remembered today mostly as a result of that 1950s television series but also later movies, including Tombstone, uh, produced in 1993, and several books, starting with Stuart Lake's Wyatt Earp, Frontier Marshal, uh, in 1931, uh, yet today still considered to be a, a, a valuable textbook on the life of Wyatt Earp. And the last published book on Wyatt Earp, my own, a Wyatt Earp anthology, Long May His Story, be told and uh, it's a fairly thick book of almost 900 pages. In actuality Wyatt Earp was a lawman who lived in the American West including time in Dodge City, Kansas and Tombstone, Arizona. He worked at a number of trades, uh, mostly gambling and mining, and as a deputy marshal took part in what is today known as the gunfight at the OK Corral, perhaps the most famous gunfight of the Old West. During that battle, Wyatt, his brothers Virgil and Morgan, along with Doc Holliday, killed three Cochise County Cowboys, the McLowry brothers, Tom and Frank, and young Billy Clanton. For many decades after his death, only some of Wyatt's story was known, basically what the early writers were able to get him to relate to them in various interviews. and then interviews with uh, those who had known him uh, throughout his life. For instance, it was known that in 1874, Wyatt settled in Wichita, Kansas, where he took a lawman's job on the Wichita Police Force and developed a reputation as a good lawman. However, it wasn't long before he was fined and fired for getting into a fight with a political opponent of his boss, the local city marshal. At that time, Wyatt left Wichita and joined his brother James in Dodge City, Kansas. Yes, the famous Dodge City. 
1878, he went to Texas to track down an outlaw, and at Fort Griffin, he met John Doc Holliday, who was to become Wyatt's closest friend until Holliday's death in 1887. The Earp brothers left Dodge City in 1879 and moved to the new booming mining town, Tombstone, Arizona. And it wasn't long until Wyatt and his brothers Virgil and Morgan began again to wear lawman's badges and came into conflict with a group of young men known as the Cowboys. That conflict escalated over the next two years, culminating in the misnamed gunfight at the OK Corral on October 26, 1881. Now why do I call it the misnamed gunfight at the OK Corral? Well, that's because the shootout actually took place in a vacant alleyway that only led to the OK Corral on the next street. But how lyrical would it sound to say the gunfight in the alleyway behind the OK Corral? Following the gunfight in December of that year, Virgil Earp was ambushed and maimed. And in March of 1882, brother Morgan Earp was assassinated while playing a game of pool. Following that, Wyatt, another brother, Warren Earp, Doc Holliday, and others went on what is today known as the Vendetta Ride and killed two or three cowboys they thought were responsible, including my own ancestor, Frank Stillwell. Frank, we now know, was the actual trigger man who killed Morgan, and two days later at the Tucson train depot, Wyatt and Doc Holliday killed Frank. One witness viewing the body said that Frank was the worst shot up man he had ever seen. This became what is known as the Vendetta Ride, and it truly was a vendetta killing, and with it, Wyatt became an outlaw and a wanted man. Well, following the tombstone affairs and the uh, aftermath of Wyatt's running from the law, he went to San Francisco where he reunited with a actress he had met in Tombstone by the name of Josephine Marcus. She became his common law wife, a relationship that lasted almost 50 years. The couple roamed the West, going many places for short periods of time, including Idaho, Nevada, Washington, up to Alaska, and back to California, with Wyatt engaging in mining and running saloons, horse racing, refereeing boxing matches, and the occasional stint as a lawman. At near the end of Wyatt's life, he got interested in the movies. At that time, of course, they were uh, silent movies, and it uh, was just the beginning of the age when there would be talking movies. And Wyatt became acquainted with several of the early Western movie actors, uh, including Tom Mix, and some say he even met a fellow named Marion Morrison. You might know him as John Wayne. Wyatt's interest in the movies was that he wanted to get his own story told, uh, especially if it could be made into a movie. But he was portrayed only one time in a movie during his lifetime. In 1923, a movie was made entitled Wild Bill Hickok, in which Wyatt was shown only for a few minutes uh, as a Kansas lawman. Wyatt died on January 13, 1929, a mostly forgotten man. But since then, he has been the subject of numerous films, television shows, biographies, works of fiction, too, that have increased his fame and notoriety, and today he is known as the Wild West's toughest and deadliest lawman. But this question, are the words of the theme song, Wyatt Earp, Wyatt Earp, brave, courageous, and bold, the real Wyatt Earp? And do the words long live his fame and long live his glory and long may his story be told reflect the complete and true story of Wyatt Earp? My answer, hardly. I came upon the Wyatt Earp story in the 1950s when on one television show, I learned that Wyatt had killed a man by the name of Frank Stillwell. And since my mother's maiden name was Stillwell, I wanted to know more. Who was this man alleged to have killed Morgan Earp and then was killed by Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday? And this started me 
on what has been an almost lifelong quest to know the rest of the story. And what I have learned is that there is much about his life that Wyeth ne never told his biographer, never told his wife Sadie, as he called her, and was never revealed in movies, especially the 1993 movie Tombstone with Kurt Russell playing Wyatt, or the 1994 movie Wyatt Earp with Kevin Costner playing Wyatt. There was much more of Wyatt's story to tell, and there are two previously unknown aspects of his life that we're going to look at today. In 1925, Wyatt wrote to a friend and said, quote, Notoriety has been the bane of my life. I detest it, and I never have put forth any effort to check the tales that have been published in recent years of the exploits in which my brothers and I are supposed to have been the principal participants. None of them is correct. My friends have urged that I make this known on printed sheet. Perhaps I shall. It will correct many mythic tales. And there are many mythic tales, many legends that have been published and told about Wyatt over the years. However, at that time, Wyatt didn't realize that we would, in the 2000s, live in an age of internet and the capability of looking at things that the historians of the 1920s and 30s had no uh, possible way of exploring, especially historic newspapers. And today we're fortunate to have a number of websites that uh, specialize in historic newspapers uh, going back to the earliest days of America and right up to the present time. And because of this, Modern historians have been able to find out many things about Wyatt Earp that he would surely be ashamed of if he was alive today. Wyatt's true story is checkered with good guy and bad guy events from his early manhood in Lamar, Missouri, to his final days in California. In most of the published uh, 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 biographical treatments, and there are a number of those, his shadowy past has been generally overlooked or glossed over by those who see him only as the lawman hero. Were he to have been a 21st century lawman, his early unlawful activities, especially those in Missouri and Indian Territory and Illinois, as we're going to discuss today, would have been scrutinized with background checks and investigations, and he would never have achieved notoriety as a lawman in Kansas or Arizona. Now today I'm emphasizing Wyatt's outlaw or criminal history because I believe it has been not given a just treatment uh, by most 20 and, 20, uh, and 21st century writers. I feel there's yet more to say in as fair a manner as possible, as possible concerning Wyatt's nefarious or disreputable side. This is not to say that he did not do a lot of good things as a lawman in his life. He did, but that side of the story is the side that most people recognize and believe. There's another side to Wyatt Earp. Fiction is based on truth. Truth came first, the fiction followed, just like the chicken and the egg. Most stories about Wyatt Earp actually have their genesis in truth. However, today more people in the general population are aware of the, the legends and the myths about Wyatt Earp than they are of the actual truth. And whether we're considering factual history or even historical fiction about Wyatt Earp and his brothers, the emphasis has always been on Wyatt's life as a lawman and what has failed to receive due emphasis is that Wyatt spent more years running from the law than he did chasing lawbreakers. Wyatt's life in the Kansas cow towns, uh, Tombstone, Arizona, Alaska, California is generally well known. However, in each of these locales, his life was one of controversy from bunco artists to taking bribes to throwing prize fights and other nefarious activities, Wyatt had a long criminal career. And this presentation today will concentrate on those events in Missouri, Indian Territory, and Illinois. The first 
recorded unlawful event in his life came on March the 14th, 1871, five days short of his 23rd birthday, while the family, the Earp family, was living in Lamar, Barton County, Missouri. Uh, interestingly, Wyatt did not tell his biographer of anything about living in Missouri, especially the events that took place in Lamar, Missouri. Rather, uh, Stuart Lake, the uh, author of the first book written, uh, or biography written on Wyatt Earp, uh, reported that during this time Wyatt was actually in Oklahoma, or what was then called uh, Indian Territory, uh, working on a survey team uh, around Fort Gibson from January of 1870 to April of 1871. Well, this is uh, provably untrue. Uh, Wyatt was not working on a survey crew. Uh, in fact, he was uh, getting into trouble. Of the Earp family, only Wyatt's sister-in-law, Allie, a wife of Wyatt's brother, Virgil, is known to have made any statements whatsoever about the family's time in uh, Missouri. She is quoted as saying, all you had to do with the Earps was to mention Lamar and they closed their mouths. I was given to understand it was a subject I must never bring up. Well, as we learn the story, we know why uh, it was not a topic of discussion. Wyatt's first law enforcement role came at the age of 21 when he was appointed constable in Lamar on November 17, 1869. Two months after taking office on January 16, 1870, he was married for the one and only time he actually had a marriage. Though as we shall see, he actually had four wives. But he had one legal marriage in uh, uh, Lamar, Missouri to a young girl named Aurilla Sutherland, or Rilla as Wyatt and the family referred to her. In November of 1870, at the age of 22, Wyatt entered and won the office of Constable of Lamar in a close race, 137 to 180 votes, and his competition was his own half-brother, Newton Earp. The reasons for this brotherly contest remain a mystery, but Wyatt was the incumbent and Newton was the challenger. Shortly after, perhaps within days, Wyatt's wife, Rilla, and by some counts an unborn baby, both died. Wyatt, still the bridegroom, was understandably distraught, heart sick. And there followed thereafter a series of events that are still somewhat murky, including a street fight involving Rilla's brothers and the Earp boys. Wyatt's incumbency as a lawman was short, 14 months. As the young widower became negligent in his duties and found himself under attachment from Barton County for a failure to account for funds that he had collected as constable. At this point, whether due to distress or disgrace or an I don't care attitude, early in 1871, Wyatt, Wyatt skipped town, quietly left the state of Missouri and behind him he left a trail of criminal activity including that he had collected over $200 in fees from two traveling circuses that were to go toward the erection of a new school and he left town with those funds. On March 13, 1871, Wyatt was charged with filing a false return to court. Uh, apparently he had erased 70 from his endorsement of a fine and penciled in 55, which allegedly allowed him to withhold $15 for himself. Curiously, Wyatt's entire family left Barton County uh, at this time. This is a story that Wyatt never told or discussed with his biographer, instead placing himself in totally erroneous locales and chronolo uh, chronology uh, to throw off potential investigation into his Lamar's sojourn. But it didn't work, and I'm here to tell you the rest of the story. And the following is factually documented. A factually documented account of Wyatt in 1871 
that cannot be successfully disputed by those who only see him as brave, courageous, and bold. Wyatt and three buddies, during a period of drinking about March 28, 1871, decided to commit larceny near Fort Gibson in the Cherokee Nation by stealing horses. Oddly enough, they stole from a African-American man named Jimmy Keyes. Sometime between March 28th and April 1st, arrest warrants for Wyatt Earp and his two buddies were given to Deputy U.S. Marshal Jacob Owens. Deputy Owens appeared before a United States Commissioner and gave the following sworn statement, quote, Wyatt S. Earp, Ed Kennedy, and John Shown, white men and not Indians, or members of any tribe of Indians by birth, marriage, or adoption, on the 28th day of March, 1871, in the Indian country, that would be what we know now as Eastern Oklahoma, did feloniously, willfully steal, take, and carry away two horses, each of the value of $100. And attached to that uh, original document, uh, which is yet in the National Archives, Owen recorded this. Now on this day, April 1871, comes the defendants and waive examination after hearing the charges, whereupon it is ordered that they find bail in the sum of $500 each, in default of which they are hereby committed to jail. Well, actually, it appears that only John Shawan was present for this uh, hearing on April 1st, and in a separate document executed the next day, the commissioner issued a writ of arrest for Earp and Kennedy, who had failed to appear. That same day, Deputy Owens uh, called together a posse, and they were sent to locate uh, Earp and Kennedy somewhere in the Indian nations. The posse traveled for some six days and covered some 200 miles in the Cherokee Nation uh, to locate and apprehend Wyatt and Kennedy. They rested one day after finding the men and subsequently covered another 200 miles over the next six days to present them before the judge. Deputy Owens filed a claim for $121 in expenses including his prisoners, Wyatt Earp and the others, for seven days. Now with the three horse thieves uh, safely ensconced in federal lockup, on April 13th, the judge took a sworn statement in the case of United States versus Wyatt S. Earp. The wife of John Shawan was called upon to give her testimony and I want to quote from it because it has some interesting details. I know Wyatt S. Earp and Ed Kennedy. They got my husband drunk near Fort Gibson about the 28th of March, 1871. They then went and got Mr. Jim Key's horses and put my husband on one and he led the other and told him to ride 50 miles toward Kansas and then they would meet him and then they would put the horses to a wagon and he could ride. I went with these two men and met my husband 50 miles north of Fort Gibson. I rode with these two men, Earp and Kennedy, in a hack. On meeting my husband, they took the two horses out of the hack and put in the two that he had. Earp drove on toward Kansas three nights. We laid over several days, and about three o'clock on the third night, James Keyes overtook us. My husband, John Sound, Shawn, said he could have the horses. The defendants, Earp and Kennedy, told Keyes that my husband stole the horses, and they also said that if my husband turned state's evidence, they would kill him. Well, we're beginning to see a little bit of the uh, situation that Wyatt has gotten himself into. And on May 8th of 1871, the grand jury was called into session. The three accused men were arraigned and when none of them could post the $500 bail, they were jailed. But later, Earp and Shawn and five other men escaped from the jail, and now comes an interesting part of the story. And I have found this in my newspaper research, something that other earlier historians did not have access to. 
I don't want to claim to be the first to find this, but I happened to come on to something that they had not found. This is from the Van Buren, Arkansas Press of May 9th, 1871, describing Wyatt's escape from jail. Quote, on Wednesday between daylight and dark, seven of the prisoners confined to the upper part of the jail made their escape by prying off the raptors at one corner and then crawling around between the roof to the grate in the back of the building where they removed the stone wall sufficiently to admit egress to the body of a man. When they tied their blankets together and lowered themselves down about 20 feet to the jail yard, they then dug a hole sufficient to crawl under the fence, which they did and made their escape without knowledge of the guard. The men that escaped were all desperate characters. Two or three were in for murder and several were in for dealing in counterfeit money and evidence for conviction most top positive in all cases. Included were Wyatt Earp, John Shawan, and others all considered to be bad men. No arrests have been made up to today, although a posse is out on the hunt. Thus Wyatt Earp became a fugitive from justice, an outlaw, and a wanted man. He failed to face prosecution and possible exoneration if he had the right lawyer. Did he bear fear of being found guilty? Was facing a possible hangman's noose more than he could countenance? But this would not be the last time in Wyatt Earp's criminal career that he fled justice. So in spite of these, uh, what we might call youthful uh, offender activities in uh, Missouri and Indian Territory or one thing, uh, his stellar lawman career uh, seems to outweigh all of those. Well, the worst was yet to come. Events that uh, took place in Lamar and the Indian nation may to some extent be excused uh, following the devastating life of his wife and unborn child. But what takes place next happens in Peoria and Bardstown, Illinois, where Wyatt had gone uh, following these uh, events in uh, Oklahoma Territory. And to me, they uh, set a pattern uh, for his life and are of what I would call moral significance. Uh, in Peoria County is where Wyatt turned to a life as a bummer, a John, and most reprehensible, a common pimp. Evidence of uh, Wyatt's demise into, to debauchery became public in the Peoria Daily Transcript of February 27, 1872 in the regular column Police News. Quote, George Randall, Wyatt Earp, and Morgan Earp, three men arrested at the ha Haspel Banyo on Hamilton Street on Saturday evening last, were brought before Justice Cunningham yesterday to answer to a charge of being found in a house of ill fame. The woman, Minnie Randall, arrested with the above named men was not prosecuted, but used as a witness, and her evidence was conclusive. The men were fined $20 each and costs. Well, lo and behold, the previous day, a complaint had been filed by Peoria City Policemen that developed into a charge styled City of Peoria versus Wyatt Earp. The complaint stated for keeping and being found in a house of ill fame. Thus, if the wording is accurate, it appears that Wyatt was being accused of being the keeper uh, of a house of ill fame. Uh, and in doing a little research on that word, being a keeper meant the person under whose management the house or brothel was being run. Then on the heels of the February charge, in May of 1872, the transcript reported this, quote, that hotbed of iniquity, the McClellan Institute on Main Street near Water, was pulled on Thursday night and, as usual, quite a number of inmates, transient and otherwise, were found therein. Wyatt Earp and his brother Morgan Earp were each fined $4.55 and, as they had not the money and would not work, they languished in the cold and silent calaboose. It does seem strange that the owner of the house in question cannot find a more respectable lot of tenants than he usually has there. Complaints arise from the whole neighborhood 
and some of the merchants nearby there are annoyed by the inmates even during the day. Well, Wyatt has crossed from uh, uh, petty theft of school funds and uh, the stealing of horses to now being accused of actually being a pimp. Uh, and that's pretty reprehensible. The uh, September issue, September 10th issue of the transcript posted under its police news another report uh, of Wyatt's philandering. Uh, quote, yesterday was a gala day as to the number of criminals at the police court. The inhabitants of the Beardstown gunboat was up for trial, including Wyatt Earp, noted as an old offender, $44. Well, the Beardstown gunboat had been converted uh, from use in the Civil War to a floating house of prostitution. And on September 17th, the county sheriff and several deputies raided the gunboat uh, and arrested a number of women uh, and men, including Wyatt Earp. And surprisingly, a woman who identified herself as Sarah Earp, the wife of Wyatt Earp. This woman was a known prostitute uh, in the area who as early as uh, 1870 was working in what was called the God Pity You Banyo of Thankful Sears. As I mentioned earlier, Wyatt is known to have had only one uh, sanctioned, state sanctioned marriage uh, to Arilla Sutherland in Lamar, Missouri, but he had at least two more well-known uh, common law marriages, we'll call them. Uh, one to Maddie Blaylock and the one to Sarah Josephine Marcus, uh, the woman that we sometimes call Josie, but Wyatt called her by the nickname of Sadie. But after learning this of what was taking place in Illinois, perhaps this woman calling herself Sally Earp or Sarah Earp should be added to the list, uh, making Wyatt the husband by marriage or common law of four wives. Well, we'll bring this part of Wyatt's story to uh, a close. Uh, they are certainly some nefarious activities in Missouri, the Cherokee Nation, and uh, Illinois, and are somewhat startling to the uh, student of Wyatt Earp who simply loves the television shows and the, the movies uh, about Wyatt Earp and think of him as brave, courageous, and bold. Uh, but I believe and I'm convinced that these accounts of outlawry are only a portion of a shadowy past which never has been recorded or written about, a pattern that he continued to follow throughout his life, which ended at the age 80 in Los Angeles, California on January 13th, 1929. Some people have said to me, Roy, you're a, you're a Wyatt basher. You're a, you're a Wyatt hater. No, actually I'm not. And I would say that Wyatt Earp is one of my uh, two favorite characters in the Wild West. Uh, the other uh, being Jack Stilwell, uh, a frontier scout uh, here at Fort Sill in Lawton, which we'll talk about in another episode. I like Wyatt Earp's story. I don't like some of the things that he did, but I don't want to be thought of as a, a Wyatt hater or a Wyatt basher. Uh, I prefer to find the truth and wherever the truth leads, that's the story to be told. Explore the past, present, and future of the Great Plains with hands-on, interactive exhibits for all ages. Learn about the people, the places, and the things that make up the Great Plains by watching a show in the auditorium, stopping by the outdoor trading post, or braving through the terrible Tuesday Tornado Theater. Schools, active military, and senior citizens can also come to enjoy the museum for a discounted price. Visit the primary tourist attraction in all of Southwest Oklahoma, the Museum of the Great Plains.